First of all, tell us a little bit about your background and the current scope of your work. So I am uh, Vice Chair and Director of Research at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary of Mount Sinai and Chief of the Retina Service there. Um, my interest is in retinal imaging. I'm a practicing vitreoretinal surgeon. Um, so in my laboratory, we've been looking at uh, advanced forms of retinal imaging, adaptive optics, OCT and geography, uh, some early types of functional imaging uh, with the overall goal to try to pick up disease earlier and when it's in a, a form that is more amenable to reversal. And so a lot of, a lot of our efforts, we've worked in um, diabetic retinopathy, we're working in glaucoma, we're working in neuro-ophthalmology uh, and age-related macular degeneration. So tell us about some of the work that you presented here at AAO 2017. Okay, so at the sub-day I presented um, the, the paradigm of early recognition of diabetic retinopathy. So we've been working with OCT angiography right. and uh, OCT angiography basically utilizes high-speed OCT and picking up very subtle changes in perfusion. And so currently the model for detecting diabetic retinopathy has to do with picking up little red dots that represent microaneurysms. So that's the point that the clinicians generally recognize as being uh, clinical disease. With OCT and geography, we actually pick up the fact that there are loss of capillary segments much earlier. And when you measure these in a volume of perfusion, you can see it start to drop off um, probably before you can appreciate any of these microaneurysms. So the question that was posed to me by the, the uh, group that invited me was, well, what's the significance of this? And how does that, how does that work? And what, looking through the data, so we, we've developed a lot of the software for, for looking at volume of perfusion and how that, how that fit with um, standard populations, control populations. Um, and in fact, uh, looking at the other data that, from other studies, you can see that when you reverse um, high A1C levels, bring them down, uh, you can see reversal of microcapillary disease. If you treat with anti-VEGF agents, you can reverse it. And of course, these are um, the anticipating the next generation of treatments, which will be oral or maybe subcutaneous injections. Uh, and you pick up early disease, you may be able to avoid the complications of having to treat with injections in the eye or laser photocoagulation. So tell me, what is the window of opportunity for reversal uh, in terms of hemoglobin A1C, for example? Well, we see it at all different levels. So there, there were studies that were done in the UK uh, where they showed even reversal between 7.9 and 7.0. But of course, in our, with our adaptive optics lab, we, when we're looking at capillary changes around the fovea, we could see changes um, the patient went from 13 to 12. So it's, it has to do, the, that range is not as critical as how much damage there is in the surrounding tissue and in terms of what's the reversibility for, for visual function. Um, are you developing a matrix so that clinicians can essentially look at the time course of a diabetic's pathology and correlate that with expected changes in retinal topography. So that's, that's the ultimate goal. What we first demonstrated was that with OCT and geography perfusion density, we could match the standard ETDRS scale in terms of progress of disease. Um, the next step is really to look at the, the, this group of diabetics who don't have recognized disease, what we found most interestingly is that in the early stages of diabetic disease, there's an increase in perfusion. 
And it's only in the later stages that it starts to drop off. So the question is, can we pick it up at that tipping point, or is that the point where we start to, to recognize disease before we see structural change? Why do you hypothesize increased perfusion occurs early on? It's, it's, I think it's the, the natural response of the system. It has a certain amount of flexibility. So if you pour more fuel in, you, the, there's a, there are mechanisms that will increase the flow um, to bring more oxygen to the area to consume the fuel. It's only when you reach the, the limit of the system for that compensation that you start to see breakdown and you start to see damage to the capillaries. Have you seen any difference between type 1 and type 2 diabetics? Um, at this point, I can't really say. I don't have a, a firm answer. What, what I do know is um, there's a big difference in terms of how they, they manage lipids. So one of the other areas that we've been interested in looking in is the impact on um, a macular pigment. And so macular pigment, um, the, the xanthophyll pigments, lutein and zeaxanthine, mesozeaxanthine, normally are sequestered into the macula. Uh, we think that they have to, they function as um, antioxidants. So th that material comes only from diet. We can't produce it. And type 2 diabetics have a lipid dysfunction very often, which I, you're familiar with. And so the, they, they seem to have a tougher time maintaining levels of that pigment. And the pigment seems to probably suppress some of the damage from free radicals. So what are the next steps for your particular line of research? So I think we want to, we want to identify uh, at what point we can move back the, the treatment protocols. So instead of waiting till we see relatively late disease, the point where we're seeing a lot of microaneurysms or uh, macular edema, can we, if we identify the disease earlier, um, can perhaps we use one of these new modalities, these uh, TIE2 inhibitors, um, the VAP1 uh, inhibitors. There are a variety of uh, calcarine um, uh, blockers as well that may be useful um, as an adjunct. And, and as I say, there's definitely reversibility. So we've seen the reversibility at the cellular level from our imaging. And the question is, can we take advantage of that um, and not have to wait until uh, we, we're basically doing damage control? So, you know, as, as you, I'm sure you're familiar that um, before 1960, um, if you had diabetes and you lived long enough, you were going to go blind. Mm -hmm. And it was only we, when we had laser introduced that the things really turned around. But laser is a really damaging modality. Um, and now with the latest studies from the, the DRCR net, they've shown that perhaps we can manage these patients with just injections. Injections are hard. Patients don't necessarily come back. So there's still a question of how we're going to integrate that information into our clinical, uh, you know, protocols. And, you know, if patients do disappear and, and, they, and they show up late, we, we've seen that oftentimes it's, it's disastrous. But, of course, once we move on to oral medications where they're more likely to have better compliance, uh, then, then it may really change how we, we address the disease. There will always be patients who won't find out until late. And, right. But it's very sad because as a vitreoretinal surgeon, we'll spend hours trying to save, mm. put the retina back in place, only to see that there are very few capillaries there to sustain right. vision. So what would your recommendations be at a policy level if we want to detect diabetes earlier from a retinal perspective, from a retinal rescue perspective or prevention perspective? So th that's, that's, that's a bit of a challenge because up until now, um, the access by internists to um, being able to pick up the disease, even to the point of fundus photographs, has is not been optimal. Um, now we have new technology which is much more sensitive and perhaps could pick these things up earlier, but 
it's expensive, it's still with only a few, few years old, so it will take some time for this to gradually, it will, it will take a number of studies. So some of the DRCRnet studies are now including OCT angiography. Some of the new pharmacological studies are starting to embrace this technology. There's, there's all, it takes a number of years for things to, people get comfortable with the change. Um, so I don't foresee the policy of um, the, the government agencies changing all that quickly. Mm -hmm. I think they, they want very solid data um, and it's going to take a few years to, to achieve that. But so would you like to see OCT angiography part of the standard workup for a new type 2 diabetic? Yes. When I see a, a new patient, I well, you know, very often I look in and the fundus picture looks pretty normal. I send the patient for, for an OCT angiogram, which only takes a few seconds, literally, I mean, a minute or two at the machine. And I can already show them that there are areas where their capillaries, there are widened spaces and when there's remodeling. And yet, if you look at the picture, it's completely normal. So switching to the recommendations that you would give to patients, given your work, what should patients know about the future of monitoring and prevention in the setting of diabetic retinopathy? I am continually astounded in this day and age that so many people are not aware of what their hemoglobin A1C levels are, that their physicians don't discuss this as a way of long-term monitoring. Some of them have monitored their sugar, some of them don't. Uh, I think that uh, as technology improves, this access to this uh, improves. I think that, you know, it's amazing over the last 10 years how quickly smartphones have, have really, you know, expanded throughout the entire globe. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the um, technology for measuring uh, parameters medically will migrate into this sort of approach. Um, I think that people have to be aware that, uh, you know, earlier treatment is, is the best solution and, and, and what's involved with that. Uh, obviously exercise and, and these sorts of things that, uh, nutritional things that we've sort of known about for a while but haven't been fully embraced by all of our colleagues. Excellent. Thank you, Professor. This has been a, a wonderful conversation and very illuminating in many different ways.